Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers to, for inviting me. And it's a real pleasure to be here. And I would like to thank ICTS for hosting this meeting. So yeah, I, I'm going to present uh, our recent results on the 2D Bose gas far from equilibrium done in the group of Zoran Hajibabic in the University of Cambridge. So the systems can be out of equilibrium in a variety of ways. And today in the talk, I would like to touch two ways uh, how the system can be out of equilibrium. So in the first part, I'll talk about the driven systems and uh, I'll discuss the birth of turbulence. So how from populating a single quantum state, we can get the turbulent flow at the end. And the second part of my talk will be on the opposite process. So on the relaxation dynamics that we first prepare some out of equilibrium state and then we look how we relax towards equilibrium. So let me begin with when speaking about our tools. So we are using uh, 2D Bose gas confined in a box trap. Uh, so basically we have a 1D lattice to confine system to two dimensions. And we have in-plane walls just to repel and, 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 and keep the in-plane potential. Using boxes for, for out of equilibrium science is sort of important because one thinks about turbulence usually in momentum space and in a box momentum is a, to a good approximation, a good quantum number. The second tool is flashback resonance, which allows us to tune interparticle interactions just by changing the magnetic field. And what I'm also going to do, we use various atomic physics methods, which I just list them here to measure the momentum distribution. Let me start with the first part of my talk. I guess I don't have to introduce turbulence here, but I would, would, would like to just make two remarks. So first of all, we are studying the wave turbulence and actually there also in 2D exists the direct energy cascade and that's what we are going to study. And secondly, there is no intrinsic viscosity in our atomic system, but we have a trap depth. So if the atom is more energetic than the trap depth, it just leaves the trap, which sets the viscosity scale. And again, the key signature of the fully developed turbulence is power law momentum distribution. Okay, so what do I mean by the birth of turbulence? If we imagine that this disk is momentum space, one generically injects energy in some anisotropic way. In our case, we inject the energy by forcing the system. Force is a vector, so it's anisotropic. But there are two key concepts in, in the birth of turbulence that what usually happens is that through some microscopic interactions at some finite k, there, uh, the isotropic, uh, <coughs> isotropic cascade front emerges, and then it propagates algebraically in time, and in its wake, the steady state momentum distribution is formed. So basically, this isotropic cascade front propagates outwards on this disk until it reaches the dissipation scale, which is set by a trap depth, and then the steady state is fully developed. In more general terms, uh, what's happening is that the momentum distribution undergoes dynamic scaling with this kind of form, and this form is happening all over the place. It comes from the critical dynamics, but here it's scaling in space and time. It also happens for the surface growth or closed system equilibration. And in general, it's uh, determined, it's described by the two exponents, alpha and beta. In principle, they can be anything, but they're linked through some conservation loss. And here, since we are dealing with uh, the power law momentum distribution in the steady state, alpha equals to gamma beta, and we, we are studying the energy cascade where the energy grows linearly in time, and this allows us to predict our exponent beta, so how the cascade front propagates based on our dimensionality of the system and the measured steady state exponent. Okay, so maybe one more thing, why we even bother to study this in our system, because certainly we don't have the largest inertial range in both gases, but we have a very controllable system that we can actually track the dynamics on all relevant length scale, and that's our advantage. So what do we start with is we have the, the atoms in a box, essentially zero temperature. So it's a condensate. And then we excite the lowest lying phonon mode with a force which is isotropic, in, uh, uni uniform in space and sinusoidal in time. And then if we shake for long and hard, we see the isotropic uh, steady state momentum distribution with a power law. The power law does not agree with the weak wave turbulence prediction. We, we get 2.9, why it should be 2. But it's known that in 2D there are strong finite size correction even in theory. So it all makes sense. And our power law is robust against changing the dry strength and some gas parameters like chemical potential. So the main question is what's happening in between. And yeah, I'll answer it with three different methods. So starting from low, low momenta, we can actually visualize the excitations of the gas 
using the interference of the excitations of the condensate. And what we see is, is the next phonon modes, which looks like standing waves, but we see that they are only appearing along one direction, and let's say that we, we see only four of those modes. So then what we do, we, we move to use another technique, the Bragg spectroscopy, which essentially allows us to just measure the one-dimensional momentum distribution. So we perform uh, two experiments. One, we measure the momentum distribution along the shaking direction, and one across the shaking direction. And what we find is that at low momenta, we see that along the shaking direction, the distribution is broader, but across it's more narrow. But what's very interesting, uh, around the inverse healing length, we see that at the wings, the two distributions coincide. And actually, the fact that it coincides around inverse healing length is not so surprising, because then the nature of the excitations in the both gas changes from phonons to free particles, and actually, uh, for phonons, the cross-direction coupling is suppressed in our gas. So now, as we have already established the isotropic cascade front, we can look at its dynamics. Here I'm showing the compensated momentum spectrum. Compensating meaning it's that I multiplied by k to the gamma, so the steady state is just a flat line on top. And we can then see how the cascade front propagates in time until it hits a wall. Here is the dissipation scale, and you can see that in, on, in long times the momentum distribution stays constant. And then if we look a little bit more closely and look how it scales, we find that the, the line is the, the predicted uh, growth <coughs> of the cascade front based on our gamma and the dimensionality of the system. And the gray shaded area is the independently estimated, uh, basically, the dis dissipation scale coming from the trap depth. Otherwise, we could also fit uh, this growth, and then we get an effective dimensionality of the system. Here is maybe trivial because it's two, we made it two. But it's a good experimental check and maybe some nice thing to study in the future, the dimensional across. And perhaps now, not surprisingly, now if we scale the full momentum distribution, we can see that in the pre-steady state, they collapse onto a single universal curve. But in the steady state, the curves start to stick out because obviously in the steady state, time has no meaning. OK, so this is our uh, view of how the steady state turbulence emerges. So at low momenta, we see that persistent anisotropy which goes, all, which, which prolongs also in the steady state, but then at some finite momentum around the inverse healing length, we see the emergence of the isotropic cascade front, and the further it propagates in algebraic fashion up to the dissipation scale, and then the steady state turbulence is established. Okay, so this marks the end of the first part of the talk, and now I'm going to the second part, which is on closed system equilibration. So, here we want to study quenches. So let's, let's imagine that we have a very non-thermal initial momentum distribution. So it's very flat and has a high K cutoff. And then if we uh, have conserved particle and uh, uh, particle number and energy, what is, gonna, what is going to happen is that for the equilibrium distribution having the same conserved quantities, particles needs to go to the IR and the energy needs to go to high K, meaning, I mean UV. So then, uh, what, what can ha often happen, or what is predicted, is that actually both IR and UV distribution could show dynamic scaling, but with different exponents. Again, with exactly the same form. And again, alpha and beta are just related by a conservation loss. And what's interesting is that this form is really happening all over the place, and this relaxation is predicted to be sort of universal, that the same dynamics is expected to happen for, very, for various systems, for QCD, cold atoms, early universe, and so on. And theoretically, it has been conceptualized with the idea that the system passing through a non-thermal fixed point, so basically, when you prepare a system really far from equilibrium, instead of the system that does not directly relax towards the thermodynamic equilibrium, but first passes through this scaling region where this dynamic scaling happens. And people saw the first experimental evidence for this scaling behavior, but there are still some quantitative, usually, problems that we see exponents which are different than theory. We don't know the robustness when you change the initial state, and all these kind of questions were begging, so that's why we, uh, we started doing experiments. Okay, so what we do here is that we start with preparing a cloud, as a, again, at temperature equal to zero, so we have a condensate, and then there is a question how to prepare actually such a crazy non-thermal initial state. And the insight came from the 3D box team in, uh, in Cambridge, and you can, you can read the references here. But essentially, the trick is to first tune the interactions to zero, 
and then shake with exactly the same gradient as we did for turbulence. And since in the box there are some residual, um, basically there are some, there, there are some small light where, where the atoms can just scatter, one can produce such nice momentum distributions and depending how long we shake, you can tune how high is our momentum distribution and how further in K space it, it went. So for this talk uh, and for, for our work, we decided to work with three different initial states, all having the same atom number, but uh, different energy. And then the, the last thing which we have to do is that now we have to start relaxation by rapidly increasing the interaction strength. So we just jump with the magnetic field and then we observe what's happening. Okay, so this is our experimental data. Here the time is color coded. So the blue line is the initial state. And there you can see that indeed we see what, what was expected theoretically, that particles go one way and the energy goes another way. And I here reproduce this dynamic scaling, just uh, out of convenience. So let's first focus on the energy part. And this is essentially free turbulence. Free, I mean not driven. So basically one can expect the exponents coming from weak wave turbulence. And their beta is equal to minus one half and alpha should be equal to four times. Uh, beta, just coming from the energy conservation. Uh, but what I want to focus now mostly is to focus on IR. And there actually we also have theoretical predictions coming from uh, non-equilibrium field theories that beta should be equal to one over Z, where Z is the critical dynamic exponent and alpha should be equal to D times beta just coming from the particle conservation, since this, this transfer is predicted to be just particle conserving. And there is one more thing I would like to say, basically excuse myself for using the word coarsening. The reason uh, I use the coarsening for, for, for this IR part is actually one can define a length scale, and then this scaling equation actually only depends on a single length scale, which, which is the definition of a coarsening, that you have one length scale in the system which just grows in time. So the only thing left in this equation is the form of the scaling function. And this is also predicted coming from the theory and for the compressible gas is expected that this kappa is equal to three and numerical simulations basically suggest this kind of scaling function for finite size systems. What's interesting is that for vortices from numerical simulations, one can get alpha and beta exponents essentially the same, but actually the kappa is, should be equal to four. This is just an analytic. And uh, we will simplify it even more. So we'll just focus at k equals zero mode, so at the condensate, and we'll look in time how it grows. Because the, this, this has various advantages. First of all, we can just focus on a single exponent <coughs> alpha, because if one puts k equal to zero, the n of, k, n of zero just grows as t to the alpha. And secondly, it allows us to put time on the x scale, which reveals lots of problems with dynamic scaling. Like very simply saying, okay, where, where do we know where is the scaling range? And this is experimentally not a trivial question. So uh, let's have a look at what are the stages of relaxation. Maybe this will allow us to understand a bit more. So basically when we start preparing some crazy initial state, it takes some non-universal time T1 to get to the scaling region. But actually, if, uh, if the, our system would always follow this universal line, it would arrive at the same point at some different time T2. So now we can define T star equal to T1 minus T2, which allows us to uh, basically define the, the, the T uni, which is a time corresponding to this universal scaling curve. And actually, since our Hamiltonian is time translation invariant, when our, uh, when our, let's say, system joins the scaling trajectory, all the dynamics can be governed just by T uni. And the, the simple analogy is if you think about this, uh, this trajectory as rail tracks, uh, basically, it doesn't matter how long you took it to go to the station, whether you grab a coffee or not, so basically how you aligned your clock. But once you board the train, you are just going according to the timetable. So then what's happening is actually that the condensate grows with this universal T uni to the power of alpha, which is equal T minus T star to the power of alpha. And uh, to see what happens if one neglects T star, which, which was usually done, is that one just gets the wrong exponent alpha and one just gets a proper exponent, obviously, when t is much larger than t star. And for theories, it's not such a big problem because they just call it prescaling. So basically, when the exponent change and can wait, 
but experimentalists fundamentally can't wait and so get wrong alpha. <laughs> and the main reason is that, that this, uh, the main problem is that often, let's say, we have the, the range that t is larger than t1, so we join the scaling trajectory, but we don't know what's the value of t star. So it's not we don't necessarily have even times much larger than t star because we have a finite size system and maybe our system already equilibrated. Okay, so how to, how to solve this problem? So what we can do instead of normal, let's say, fitting on a log log plot, we can just plot uh, n0 to some power 1 over alpha prime. And actually what we noticed is only for alpha prime equal to the proper alpha, the growth is linear in time, and it scales as just t minus t star, with the intercept with n equal to 0, re revealing t star. Here are just examples of, of, of the data with different, with, let's say, plotting the same data with different, uh, compensate like with different alpha primes. And so we have the free, initial, free our initial conditions and we can test uh, our new analysis. So when we use uh, the experimental alpha equal to one, we see that our data uh, is fitted well but f by three straight parallel lines and all the difference in the dynamics despite the different initial conditions is captured by just a, a different value of T star. And if we uh, independently for each of the curves uh, require linearity, we find that we find values consistent with. Okay, this is how it started. So otherwise we, pre we, we basically uh, had, uh, we didn't know about the T star initially, and then you can basically get any exponent. From 0 0.5 to 1.6, that's how we started, but then basically you can do any shift and basically you can get almost any exponent. And all of these fits look, at least for the experimentalists, like plausible power law fits over our limited ranges. While for the T star, it just means the redefinition, you just need to add this time offset to our T star. Okay, so now we know that the scaling dynamics needs to be done with our T uni. So we can look at the full momentum distribution curves. And then what's happening here, I'm showing five different experimental curves. Three have the same. Uh, Time, laboratory time, and three have the same universal time. So the three curves which, are, which have the same universal time actually lie exactly on top of each other. They are here, these here three slides. But they have all different initial conditions with different energies. And then what we can do, we can just color code all of our data coming from three different initial conditions using our extracted T universal. And this gives us this beautiful rainbow, which can then be collapsed on top of one single universal curve using theoretical exponents, alpha equal one and beta equal one half. And actually this curve here uh, has this porot tail shape with exponent kappa equal to three. This is just theoretical, but if we fit, we get 2.9 plus minus 0 0.1. And this super universality sort of that we have different, uh, different initial states and, and still the same dynamics seemingly, should be taken for granted actually. It's, it's there because we have the same microscopic parameters, so the same interaction, the same density, and we have the same value of the conserved quantity by the transport, so here the particle number. Basically, it's just that the integral, integral of the curves needs to be constant to be able to collapse them. So now if we move to the UV dynamics, uh, First of all, we, we know now that we have to deal with the T star, which can be in principle different than in the UV. There is, in the IR, there is no reason that it has to be actually the same. And we do not have any length scale like k equals zero, which, which you can just easily look that it's proportional to alpha. But then what one can do is to look at some higher moment. We look at the, the, the energy density, which is the third moment of momentum distribution. And actually with very simple, Manipulation one can show us that this peak of this energy density to the power one over beta again scales as t minus t star, and it's, it 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 can be easily extracted from experimental data. And then uh, the same thing happens. So basically, we do exactly the same analysis. We plot this k epsilon to the power of uh, <coughs> minus one over beta, and then you see two straight lines. And one can see that the extracted beta is again consistent with the theoretical exponent minus one half. But what is immediately visible is actually that these two lines have different slopes. And this actually is coming from the fact that the, basically the two, that the conserved quantity, so here the energy, so these two states are 
the two initial states are actually very different for the UV dynamics. And the ratio will give something like a universal uh, clock speed, which will become apparent soon if I start collapsing the full momentum distributions. So here are, this is our data, this is momentum distribution in the, in the UV part, again color coded with the T universal. And then if we collapsed using T universal and uh, theoretical exponents alpha and beta, we see that it collapses nicely on two curves. But then there is one thing missing for us to, to really collapse all the data on top of each other, so there are two components. First of all, we have to normalize our momentum distribution with measured energies, energy one and energy two. And secondly, we need to normalize this universal clock speed by the measured speeds, this basically by the slopes, oh, sorry, by, by those slopes. And then when you adjust the clock speed, we see that everything collapses on a single universal curve. Okay, so uh, that's what I was trying to, uh, to tell you, that in the first part of my talk, I described the birth of 2D wave turbulence, where I showed the emergence of isotropy under continuous anisotropic drive, and I showed the dynamic scaling in the pre-steady state. And for the coarsening, for the second part of my talk, I showed that uh, we see the universal dynamics with parameter-free agreement with theoretical predictions, and we find some new analysis method for relevant for all future studies of far from equilibrium universality, and this, is based, this work is based on these two papers. So looking in the future for turbulence, it's very natural also to think about inverse cascades, and the interplay between vortex and wave turbulence in the 2D system when in 2D one usually thinks about vortex turbulence. And for coarsening especially, let's say, trying to <clears throat> understand the dynamics of uh, the similar coarsening but with vortex rich states where the vortices should dominate the dynamics and the different exponents are expected, also some anomalous fixed points are expected. So that would be interesting, as well as tuning the system openness, how these ideas of closed system equilibration hold together. And with this, I would like to thank the team, uh, especially Martin, who is a leading PhD student of the second work, and obviously Zoran. And I would like to thank you with the atomic thank you. Thank you, Maciek. Any questions? So, thanks a lot for the exciting presentation. I have a question on the uh, long-term dynamics. When uh, you start including the fact that the distribution of the atoms has to tend to a Bose distribution? Yeah, that's a very good question. Okay. <laughs> you already know the question. <laughs> that's a very good question. Actually, let's say in the long times, let's say if you... Okay. Basically, we are, okay, maybe I'll, I, 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 I'll say a few caveats. Okay, so here, uh, this final distribution, which you see at long times, is actually very far from our final distribution. Just because of our resolution, actually, this peak should grow much further up. So we are actually quite far from real thermodynamic. Uh, we basically we are far from the time where we actually reach the true, uh, true equilibration time. That's one thing. Uh, whether, yeah, so that, that, that's the main answer, that we are still quite far and we, are not, we cannot probe just because of our momentum space resolution. That's the simplest answer. The second answer is that, that indeed, let's say, if you would try to fit sort of some distributions to these non-equilibrium shapes, they resemble some kind of Bose-Einstein distribution just with very crazy values of, let's say, temperature and chemical potential, so it clearly doesn't have yet the meaning. Let's say for the, for the distributions which we have to here, but it's indeed a very good question, and it's, it's very interesting what happens when one, one would be able to actually probe experimentally what's happening when, when you reach thermodynamic equilibrium. Hey, the momentum distribution expected for thermodynamics. What would be the occupation of the mode? So would it be still classical or you would be on the, on the exponential uh, tail of quantum mechanics? Well, we are definitely not on the exponential tail of quantum mechanics because the, the distribution, they are, not, they are not similar to any exponential. Are, so basically there are no Rayleigh genes, no, nothing like that is, is here visible in the distribution. So this is still some, some weird shape. 
So yeah, so yeah, that's that's what I can say. Yeah, so I just wanted to ask, um, the original experiments that were done by Nir Navon um, for 3D yes. wave turbulence, um, I think they saw an exponent that doesn't quite match yeah. with the wave turbulence predictions. And um, I mean, is it the case then that for 2D, the agreement is better or? I mean, no, the two, in 2D agreement is even worse. It's worse. Ba basically, yeah. the, the, the exponent is 2 expected, but what we measure is 2.9. But let's say if I even just plug the most naive log correction based on our size of our inertia range, one would immediately get to something like 2.4. And if I look at some numerical simulations which were done, this thing around, let's say, 2.8, 2.9 appears in this finite size system. So I would attribute it to actually to finite size dynamics. You think it's OK. Yeah, and but I, I obviously I don't know. I don't have a proof. Because let's say when the corrections is logarithmic, OK, we can Maybe make our box a factor of two larger, but... I mean, the problem in 2D also is that the two uh, arises both for the equilibrium distribution yes. as well as the flux. Yes, that's and the, so yeah. you can't make the distinction. Yeah, exactly. That. And that's, uh, that's actually the main reason why this correction is so strong. Yeah. Even in theory, that's the main reason that basically if you, have, if you want to have some energy flux, your distribution needs to be steeper. If I may I comment on a question, uh, instead of coarsening what you know, call it self-similarity, that's normally when you have this type of scaling. Why I don't call it self-similarity? Well, just a common, yeah, you said that. Ah, that I call it because coarsening. You said you, forgive me to use the word coarsening. It ah, looks no, like no, self-similarity. No, no, self no, 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 just, just for me, let's say, initially, when, when you're, let's say, maybe that's just me being in, in sort of a bubble, that for me, the natural way of saying it is just, okay, this is just relaxation dynamics. But then, okay, what we see is actually that this is coarsening because it's governed just by one length scale. So that's why I call it coarsening. And then a silly question, uh, depending on your answer. In, in your infrared case, on the three uh, initial conditions that you have, they are actually symmetric with respect to zero with respect to the, the stars. So you have minus 30, zero, and 30. Is uh, that just a complete coincidence? Yeah, it's a complete coincidence. So it we was just, a silly we just, question. We just, we just selected the, the basically, basically, we selected as different initial states as we could. So basically, we could basically, pre we could basically, we could produce some state which turns out to be very close to basically to, to, to the scaling trajectory, but advanced or let's say very far, reaching very, very early, but let's say it still takes a lot of time. It's coincidence. Yeah, it's actually a very big coincidence that initially we had the states with, with T star equal to, uh, to zero, which we had a bunch of them. I'm sure I was showing here just three, but basically what we had was, let's say, lots of ones and some other outliers. So that was not so easy to spot. Any last comments or questions? If not, let us, we have a last one. So Nick, thanks. Hi, thanks, very nice talk. Can you go to your conclusions? I just yes. want just to, um, that plot would do. I, I was just curious about this gray band that you have there in that inset, um, you know, for one over alpha prime. Ah, yes. So uh, in, in plotting in the main thing, are you choosing the value one there? Is, is that what you think is normalized coming from theory or are you picking the minima of these different no, we pick, we pick one because otherwise the T star has no meaning. So the wouldn't the minimum the, of the distribution make sense? The minimum of the sort of the plot? Yeah, basically, if, yeah, basically yes. This is, that's why we say that it's consistent with one and then we have to pick one for all of those because then this, this allows us then to use a single clock. Basically, and this okay. makes any sense. Otherwise, the T star has no meaning essentially if we have different exponents. That's the problem. Thank you. All right, with that, let's thank Machi and all the speakers of today. Thank you.